Good morning. Feels like the church is empty with like 70 kids left up here. <laughs> it's all good. It's good to have lots of kids, right? <clears throat> so I want to welcome you again to Cornerstone. Uh, if you don't know me, I'm Chris. I'm not the pastor here. I'm an elder here. Um, so I'm kind of, we kind of, us elders kind of share the duties of pastoring the church. So I um, was asked to do the message this morning, kind of give Mike a break. Uh, really excited about uh what God's put on my heart, and hope you guys can get, get something from it. Hopefully, it can draw you closer to God through it. Uh, we're starting a new series this morning, and uh, when you, some of you probably, uh, when you found out that I was doing the message, you probably thought, "I thought the letdown series ended last week." But <laughs> no, hopefully, it's not too big a letdown that uh, what I've got for you this morning, or what God's got for you through me this morning. So, I brought this bag with me this morning. Uh, some people will call this a tackle bag. I call it or a box, I guess, but it's a tackle bag. Um, one of my favorite things to do in life is to fish. Um, it's like, I don't know, it's probably one of the top things in my top five anyway. Um, I've always enjoyed fishing, and the, one of the most fun things about it is trying to figure out, you know, uh, where fish are at in the water, um, what, they're, what they're trying to, what they're eating, uh, find a way to catch them, um, and feel that adrenaline rush from catching the fish. So it's really, it's a good challenge to, uh, and a fun thing to do. It's a good hobby. Some of you are probably like, yeah, whatever, fishing's not fun. But uh, for me, it's a really fun thing to do, and, and it'll, it'll kind of tie into uh, what I'm going to talk about this morning. But, you know, it's, uh, it's pretty challenging sometimes to figure out where the fish are, what they're keying on, what they're biting. Um, but it's a really fun and challenging thing to do. But uh, professional fishermen, right, the people that make a living off of fishing, that's kind of what they do. And uh, they have to be really good at this, right? They have to figure out how, how to catch a fish or they don't eat, right? So they're really good at figuring out where the fish are, what they're doing, what they're relating to, how to catch them, what they're eating. So they pay attention to all sorts of things, right? They pay attention to the weather. Uh, they pay attention to uh, what kind of water they're in. Is the water clear? Is it muddy? Uh, are there rocks on the bottom? Uh, is there any kind of vegetation? Are there trees in the water? Are there docks in the water? Uh, all those different things. What kind of fish, other animals live in the water? So what would the fish may be, what may they be eating um, in the water? So one of the most important things about that is your lure, right? Uh, if you have a lure that doesn't look like fish food, they're probably not going to eat it, right? I mean, you might get lucky. Sometimes you can catch a fish or two on uh, something that doesn't look natural, like there's no way they've mistaken this for food. But uh, you, can get, you can get lucky sometimes. But if you consistently want to catch fish, you have to have a lure that presents something natural to them, right? It looks like something they're used to eating. Um, so when a professional fisherman, when they finally get a bite, right, they pay attention to everything at that instant. They're like, okay, how deep's the water here? What's the water temperature? What, how was I retrieving my lure? What, what's going on here? So they, they key on that, and they can get a pattern, um, and then they can figure out how to catch more fish. So, um, again, one of the most important things there is does it look natural? Does your, does your lure look natural? Uh, some fish are predatory fish, right? Their sole purpose in life is to swim, reproduce, and eat. So they, uh, they have this kind of this brain that's wired that if they see food and they're convinced it's food, they just can't say no, right? They can't resist. It's like their brain is wired so that they simply cannot say no. They see food, they have to eat it. So, um, and they're particularly bass. I talk about bass because I kind of know a little bit more about that. But And some of y'all are probably going to get really bored in this first part of the message, but stick with me, okay? So... Anyway, particularly bass, they're like, they're these predatory fish, right? So they eat other fish, um, and they have this killer instinct, just like I was talking about. Um, but, you know, they're pretty lazy too, right? So they, they take opportunity to, to get an easy meal when it's presented to them. They take that opportunity, even if they're not hungry. You know, if they're uh, in the water and they're not hungry and a minnow darts by really fast, they, you know, they might not pay any attention. They're like, yeah, whatever, go. But if they're sitting there and they're not hungry and this fish is, another fish is injured and, you know, it comes floating by, kind of swimming sideways and uh, all out of sorts, like it's been injured by another fish and maybe a little stream of blood pouring out, you know, they just can't resist. Their mind says, that's food, eat it, even if they're not hungry. Um, as I was going through this, uh, getting ready for this and talking through uh, fishing and uh, injured minnows, it brought back a memory. It's kind of a traumatic memory for our family, but uh, I'll share it with you. Uh, Gracie was in the first service, but um, so she got to hear it again. But So we got this great, great idea. We wanted to have fish, right? When we wanted some pet fish. Um, so we went to the pet store. We found out, you know, you have to get the aquarium. You have to uh, put it in the house for a few days, put the water in, put all the, all the little neat little knickknacks and the filter and all that, and let it sit for a few days with the filter running. Uh, kind of gets the water to the right temperature, gets it filtered out, gets it ready for the fish. Otherwise, you pour the fish 
directly into that water, they're going to die immediately, right? So we did the whole deal. We got the aquarium, got it in the house early. Uh, we go to the pet store, um, and they're like, okay, you can have, you know, about one inch of fish per gallon of water in your tank. Okay, so we got a 10-gallon tank, so we're thinking, uh, you know, seven to ten fish is pretty good for, uh, we ended up going with guppies, they're real small little fish if you know what guppies are, but I never could figure out, this is weird, like they say you can have one inch of fish per gallon, but when you're in a pet store, they have like 150 of these suckers in one little, <laughs> I'm like, okay, whatever, so apparently they know something we don't, or they know that we will fail at taking care of them, uh, so we ended up getting seven guppies, right, we got all these different colors, we picked out the pretty ones and we liked them, and there was this one, it was like this really... It was multiple shades of blue, right? And it was just beautiful. All of us, it was our favorite one out of the seven that we got. And we picked out a name for it first, and it was all exciting. And so we get home, we got the fish, and it's like this big moment. We're pouring them in. The girls are there with me watching and poured the fish in. And apparently, um, there was a piece missing from the filter that Dad missed. Um, and you can probably guess where this is going by now. But um, there's a little piece on the filter that kind of keeps the fish from going into the filter. Well, that was gone, and we didn't realize it until our favorite blue fish went into the filter. Uh, so you hear this horrid sound, you know, of the fish in the impeller. Then the girls are screaming, ah, turn it off. So I'm scrambling to unplug the filter because it had no switch. And to my surprise, the fish survived, right? He, uh, he came back out of the filter, but he wasn't doing so well. He was uh, missing some fins and kind of swimming, you know, swimming sideways. So. It was, uh, it was pretty bad, but uh, so we had, we're down to six fish, right? But, um, and if several weeks into this, we keep losing fish, fish die, fish die. We have three fish now, so those have held on for several weeks, so we're doing pretty good. Um, yeah, so I thought I'd share that with you. But anyway, back to fishing. Uh, when a fish is convinced that there's food in front of him, he just can't resist it, right? He has to eat it. That's his, that's his nature. That's what he's done. That's what he's geared to do. And there are certain times when more, the fish are more vulnerable than others, right? If they're really hungry, obviously they're more vulnerable. They're going to eat more. Um, I'm going back to bass a little bit. Sorry again for you all that don't care, but uh, just stay with me. Stay with me. So bass, when they, uh, when they spawn, which is their reproduction cycle, they move into certain areas. Like all the fish will kind of move at the same time. They'll move up into shallower water. Uh, so professional fishermen know this. They know when fish are moving. They can tell by the water temperature and the weather and all that, that when fish are going to be where they're supposed to be. And as they're, when they spawn, they make a bed and they lay their eggs and they, uh, and they have little hatchlings or whatever. So Whenever they do that, they stay on the bed and protect the, the eggs and the hatchlings from other predators. So they're like stationary on this bed for a long time, and they don't move. So right before that, they have to eat a lot, right? Because they know they're going to be in one spot, and they can't leave to go eat. So they, they eat, eat a lot right before they spawn. So they're gorging themselves, kind of like a bear before a hibernation. So just... You follow me? Every, you know, fish are more vulnerable when they're about ready to spawn because they have to eat, eat, eat. They're getting ready to spawn. they gotta, they got to fill their stomachs so that they can uh, focus solely on protecting that bed. So I say all this, and I talk about all this to kind of go into the message here. Was, And Satan, he's a lot like a fisherman, right? He, uh, he entices humans just like fishermen entice fish. He kind of pays attention to what triggers us, right? He knows... He pays attention to uh, what weather makes us depressed or what, what weather makes us sad, what weather makes us happy. Uh, he, he knows what things will trigger our, sin, our sinful tendencies. He knows our weaknesses. Um, he knows where we're, how we're wired and what bait to place in front of us, right? He's always trying to lure us away from, from God, and he knows what to throw in front of us. If, we're, you know, if we struggle with money, if we're greedy or whatever, he, he'll put us in situations where if we were just be a little dishonest, we could probably gain some money, right? There's situations in maybe, uh, maybe in business or if you just be a little dishonest, you might get a raise or a promotion. Uh, and Satan knows that. He'll present those opportunities and, and, and waits for us to bite. Um, but there's a hook there. You know, he'll, he'll say, oh, it won't hurt anything. It's just a little bit, right? It won't, nobody will notice. You can, get, you can get away with this. And he's good at disguising things behind things that look natural to us. Just like a fisherman wants his bait to look natural so the fish will bite it, Satan wants these things to look natural, and he disguises things very well. Uh, he, you know, he tempted Adam and Eve, the original sin, he attempted them through food, right? This food was something they had to have. It was natural. Um, he convinced them that God was trying to withhold something from them. So uh, he's, he's like, you know, God, if God really loved you, he would want you to have this. Why don't you, why don't you partake in it? And so uh, it brings us to one point here is our strongest temptations are disguised behind good things. 
So for you and I, the strongest, the hardest things to resist are those things that are disguised behind good things. You know, Satan, he takes things that God created to sustain us uh, and bring us pleasure, and he twists our perspective on them. He distorts them so that uh, he, he convinces us that to use them in, in ways that God did not intend. Uh, you know, society doesn't really help either, right? Society condones it and kind of uh, it actually encourages us to do sinful things. Uh, you know, we're, we're bombarded all the time with sexual temptation. We're encouraged to hate people because they're not like us, right? If they're different from us, we shouldn't associate with them. Um, you know, we should do things our way. If it feels good, do it kind of deal. Uh, you know, if you're attracted to somebody or something, by all means, you should partake, right? It's, God wants you to be happy. You should do this, even if, it, even if it's outside of God's will. And I go back to that original sin, right, where um, Satan convinced Adam and Eve, you know, that uh, this fruit was somehow, uh, they desired it. It was, a good, it was a good desire for them to desire food. And he convinced them somehow that God was withholding something from them to where they would uh, go ahead and partake. And sin, really, it's ultimately we put, we put ourselves above God, right? We put our own judgment above God's judgment, um, thinking that we know what's best. We, we, we feel like uh, if something's, something feels good, we're going we're gonna to do it. That's what we should do. It's, that's what's best for us. Um, but God created us to rely on him for everything. We'll go back to Adam and Eve again. He created them to rely on him for everything, um, to be fully dependent on him. He supplied all their needs. All they had to do was just follow his commands and follow his will. Uh, they put these desires, he put these desires within Adam and Eve, within us, but we're to look to him to fulfill those desires. But again, Satan convinced them that somehow uh, their desire for food was being deprived somehow because God wouldn't let them have this certain fruit. And he convinced them to fulfill that desire outside of God's will. You know, we desire food. Uh, Satan tempts us toward undisciplined eating. Uh, we desire sleep, and he, uh, he uh, tempts us toward being lazy. Um, I desire going fishing. He tempts me to leave my family all the time and go fishing. But um, that's a that's a tough one to fight for me. Uh, he desires us. He, we desire sex. He puts sex in us as a desire for us. It, it's to to sustain us, uh, to bring us pleasure. But Satan tempts us towards lust and pornography and homosexuality. Um, we desire uh, all these good things that God gave us, but Satan tempts us to turn those things and to use them outside of God's will. So. Um, our natural desires, they're not really wrong, right? Those things that God put in us are not wrong. They're wrong. What's wrong is when we allow those desires to pull us away from God's plan. So uh, Mike's been sharing a few uh, quotes from C.S. Lewis over the past few weeks. Uh, he's a very eloquent uh, writer, good, gives some good analogies. So um, I was tempted to, uh, I get here, here's a temptation from Satan this morning to take this piece out of the message, but um, uh, just because it, you know, it makes me nervous or whatever to talk about it. But, and I, before I start talking really about this, if you have kids that are almost teenagers or uh, maybe have not had the talk that uh, this part, sorry, you're probably going to have to have the talk after this, uh, after this message. <laughs> but don't feel bad because I'm with you, right? I'll, got, I'll have to do the same thing because Gracie was up here first service, so I'm dreading that point. And sorry, and uh, don't call me for help, so... <laughs> Uh, okay, let's read this quote from C.S. Lewis. You can get a large audience together for a striptease act, that is, to watch a girl undress on the stage. Now suppose you came to a country where you could fill a theater by simply bringing a covered plate onto the stage and then slowly lifting the cover so as to let everyone see, just before the lights went out, that it contained a mutton chop or a bit of bacon. I don't know what a mutton chopper is, but if, maybe a pizza or a big cheeseburger or something like that. Wouldn't you think that something was wrong uh, would you not think that in that country something had gone wrong with the appetite for food? So you think about that. You've got these things, again, God created these things, these things to sustain us, to bring us pleasure. You've got the S word that ends with X over here, and you've got, you got the food over here. They're, they were created for us, right, to sustain us, to bring us pleasure. But we've distorted things so much on this side uh, with sex that it's become sinful to even talk about it really, Right. Um, and and we, we don't do that with food, though, right? Food is sustained. It's just food. We don't go crazy and get excited and whatever. But for some reason, we've twisted, we've twisted sex to be something that's taboo and shouldn't talk about it. But here's the, here's the next part of the C.S. Lewis quote. Like all powerful lies, it is based on a truth. The truth acknowledged above that sex in itself, apart from the excesses and obsessions that have grown around it, is normal and healthy and all the rest of it. 
The lie consists in the suggestion that any sexual act to which you are tempted at the moment is also healthy and normal. The first temptation came in the form of something God created. So y'all follow, y'all follow that analogy there? All right, it's not, it's a truth. The truth is that sex is pleasurable, but when we start to distort that and take it outside of how God intended it, that's when it becomes a problem. Um, and that's when, that's when we, uh, we have to watch and be careful. Um, the, you know, the, the crazy thing is, the scary thing is about this, um, and you probably realize this, but this, it's the first point I want to make, it's in your bulletin, is no one is exempt from temptation. <clears throat> Not even Jesus, right? Even Jesus was tempted. We read in Matthew 4, uh, Jesus is out in the wilderness, he's fasting, it says Satan came to him while he was in the wilderness fasting and said, you know, he was going to tempt Jesus. He knew he was vulnerable at that point, just like you know, fish are hungry, they're vulnerable. Satan was hungry because he had been fasting. So Satan took his opportunity, came to him and says, you know, if you're the son of God. If you're, why are you hungry? Why, why are you starving? Why don't you, why don't you just turn these stones into bread and you won't have to be hungry anymore? Right? That's Satan tempts him to that. Um, and he says, he takes Jesus to the highest point of the temple. He says, if you're really the son of God, you can jump off of here and all the angels will come and they'll save you. You won't be hurt. He says, if you're really the son of God, I, you could have the world, right? Takes him to a high place and says, look at all this. So if you'll, just, if you'll just worship me, you can have all this, right? But Jesus was, he was able to resist that. One, he was fully God, right? He was fully human. Uh, he had the desire for food just like other, other humans do. But he was able to resist that because he was the son of God. Um, you know, really, if you think about it, Jesus, he, he could have sinned, right? He was, don't, don't take this wrong, he was fully human, so he could have physically sinned but since he was God he could not sin so you follow me there with that everybody got that he, he was able to resist that temptation and you know Satan is all he's out to get Jesus he's out to get the kingdom of God he's out to attack the kingdom of, of heaven and so that's one reason why temptation doesn't go away when we accept Jesus that's the next point in your bulletin temptation does not go away when we accept Jesus as our savior if anything it gets stronger right uh, it, it makes us more aware of things. We we start thinking about um, we start thinking about things we wouldn't have thought of before we accepted Jesus, and it's easier and uh, easier to be tempted. And, and uh, Satan attacks us more often. He ratchets up the intensity a little bit and the frequency. And you know, so every temptation is presented by Satan. It's a direct attack on the kingdom of God. And there's a, there's a spiritual battle that's happening around us, right? We're, we'll read this in Ephesians six ten. Um, I'll try to read it from the screen because sometimes the ones I put in my notes don't match exactly word for word, so I'll read it from the screen. <clears throat> a final word, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all strategies of the devil. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. Therefore, put on every piece of God's armor so you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. And after the battle, you will still be standing firm. So, we read all this, and it talks about uh, this, this battle that's happening. It says it's in the uh, heavenly realms, in the, in the places that we can't see, in the unseen world. There's this cosmic battle going on between the kingdom of Satan and the kingdom of God. It's, it's a universal battle. And it's happening way beyond just us, right, between you and I. But it's also a personal spiritual battle. Um, things are directed directly to each one of us. Satan and his demons, their motive is to, to destroy the kingdom of God, and the only way that they can even have a chance at that is to attack us, right? Since we associate with Christ, once we're a believer, we associate with Christ. We're part of his kingdom. Satan's and his demons, they, they are dead set on destroying the Messiah, so they attack us. They're out to devour, devour us. A um, little piece of scripture that will be on your screen here is 1 Peter 5.8. It says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walks about seeking whom he may devour. Satan's like a roaring lion. He's walking around. He's trying to devour us. He's trying to lure us away to the point where he can just devour us. John 10.10, we've heard this one before. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. He's out to get us, right? He's out to get each one of us individually because we're all... If we're a believer, we're a part of the kingdom, and that's how he can get to Christ. And that's why everyone is tempted in different ways. That's your next, your next point in your bulletin. Everyone is tempted in different ways. Right? My weaknesses are not your weaknesses, right? My tendencies are not your tendencies. You have struggles that are things I may not even think about. Um, I have temptations that you may not even think about. 
one that one that uh, is a struggle is being up here either seeing or bringing the message is I'm tempted to want the glory that should be God's, right? I want you guys to be impressed or say, wow, that was great, that was a good message. But really, I'm up here for God's glory. It's a temptation that I have to fight. I'm tempted to be angry with my kids or with my wife or I'm tempted to be lazy. I'm tempted to want things that my neighbors have that I could never afford. Um, you know, tempted to be dishonest at times. Um, so we're all tempted in different ways. Um, and sometimes we don't even realize we're being tempted, right? I mean, it's Satan's so good at disguising that lore that we don't even know. We're being pulled away from the path. We're being pulled away from God, and we don't even realize it. Um, as I was studying for this, I came across a quote. It kind of goes along with that. It says, you're on the verge of wrecking your life, especially if you don't know it. So if, if we're really close to the edge and about to be over the cliff and we don't even realize it, you know, Satan's convinced us, convinced us that what we're doing is okay, that, you know, we've compromised a bunch of times and we're really close to the edge and we don't even know it, that's a dangerous place to be. Um, so, you know, Satan's really good at disguising things and making us think that we're not all that bad, right? That we're, we're okay, we, we can do this, God, God really wants you to be happy, so just keep doing it. Um, and here I got several analogies. I like analogies, and uh, they uh, kind of re- reinforce the message. So I got one here for you. I'll read through this. And, um, it says, For a long time, cattle workers would forcefully push and prod cows into the slaughterhouse. For good reason, the cows would resist, and the whole operation would be extremely difficult to carry out until one specific scientist came along and said, No, no, no. The way to slaughter cows is to make them feel like everything is great as they enter the slaughterhouse. Keep the scenery the same as it is in the most peaceful moments of the cow's life. The scientists began to experiment, not with prodding cows off a truck, but by leading them quietly onto a ramp where they walked through a squeeze chute, a gentle pressure device designed to mimic a mother's nuzzling touch. Then the cattle continued down the ramp onto a smoothly curving path with no sudden turns. The path that is designed, it's curved so that they can only see so far ahead and they don't become alarmed. Uh, The path is designed to give the cows a sense that they are going home. And as they mosey along the path, they don't even notice that their hooves are no longer touching the ground. A conveyor belt slowly, gradually lifts them from the stomach upward. And then, in the twinkling of an eye, BAM! (laughs) I had to use the other hand. I used my left hand first service, and I got a blood blister. uh, (laughs) I've been waiting for weeks to do that, but... uh, I wish there was a camera facing y'all so I could see you. (laughs) Anyway, a a blunt instrument levels a strike right through, right between their eyes. It stuns them so that they don't even know what's happening. They're transitioned from livestock to meat, and they're never even aware enough to be alarmed by it. So that kind of goes along with if you're if you're on the verge of and a verge of ruining your life, you don't even know it. That's a dangerous place to be. So how do we avoid all this? How do we avoid being lured away uh, by Satan's temptations and away from God's will? We need boundaries. Um, that's, the, that's in your bulletin too. We need boundaries. We have to set up some boundaries in our life to keep us away from danger, to alarm us that when things are not going the right way, that we're veering off the path. Um, just It kind of alarms us and says, hey, you're, you're going the wrong way, dummy. Um, we need some margin or guardrails. Um, one of the first sermon series that I heard here at Cornerstone stuck with me, and I'd say a lot of people probably remember this if you've been around for a few years, but it was the uh, sermon series called Margin. And it talked about, you know, the margin is the edge of the page that kind of warns you that you're getting close to the edge of the page. And uh, I think it was Travis that uh, had a little illustration where he was balancing on the edge of the stage like this. And he's like, you know, if somebody, if you're on the edge and somebody comes over and gives you a little nudge, it's pretty easy to knock you off, right? But if you're a couple feet away and somebody comes and nudges you, you can catch yourself and you're not going to fall off the stage. That's kind of what we're talking about here. Boundaries or margin or guardrails keep us from falling off of the edge, um, keeps us from going over the, over the edge and into, a, into the abyss. So uh, Mike, Mike mentioned a few weeks ago in a sermon about guardrails how uh, if there's guardrails on the road, it's a good thing, right? It's not good if you hit a guardrail. It's going to hurt and mess up your car a little bit, but it's better than the alternative, right? It's better than going over the cliff and um, potentially dying. So, uh, you know, it, the more we, the closer we are to the edge, the easier it is to fall off. Uh, a small decision that we make today 
Uh, if we're far enough from the edge, it's a little small mistake. It's not that big a deal. We can kind of, we can scoot back over a little bit. But the more of those bad decisions we make, the closer we get to the edge, those small decisions uh, can lead to big, large consequences. That's the next point in your bulletin. Small decisions can have large consequences. One small decision today may not really affect things so much today, but it just pulls you farther and farther away from God, right? The more, uh, the more of those little decisions you make, uh, the larger the consequence might be. Um, has anybody ever heard of the butterfly effect? I have to kind of talk slow because I, I don't want to say butterfly effect when I say that. But the butterfly, butterfly <laughs> I told you, the butterfly effect is, uh, here's the definition of it. This is the scientific definition, so I'll give, you the, I'll give you an easier one. But it says, in chaos theory, the butterfly effect is the sensitive dependence on initial conditions in which a small change in one state of a deterministic nonlinear system can result in large differences in a later state. I have to read that. All like scientists, but so basically, what that's saying is, one small decision can change the outcome drastically. Um, this goes back to the '60s, where a meteorologist was using the computer, probably a computer the size of this room, to do uh, to do a weather uh, prediction. So he ran this model, and uh, there's all these mathematical things that happen to uh, spit out a weather model. He ran this model, and he wanted to rerun it to kind of get a better uh, understanding of it. He wanted to analyze it a little bit more, but he didn't want to do the whole entire thing because it might, would take too long. Uh, so he, he got the printout, which is the, the report that prints out from the, from the prediction or whatever, and it has these numbers that uh, signify to the computer and spits out this model. So the number that he picked was like a quarter of the way through the model, um, and that number was 0.506. So he puts 0 .506 into the model, leaves, goes for a break for a few minutes, comes back, and he sees that the model has gone through, through a few months of the, the cycle of the weather pattern, and he sees that the end, the result is way different than what he did the first time. So he, and he's kind of confused. It's like, what, what happened? It's like this, this time it came out as almost like a hurricane. But before, it was like a partly cloudy and uh, just a little bit of a breeze. Uh, but somehow, something had gone wrong in the model, and it came out completely different. So he went back, he checked his report, he's like, no, that's the right number, I put the right number in, what's, what's going on? And what he didn't realize at the time was the report rounded the number off. So the, the number was supposed to be 0 .506127, six, you know, six decimal places, but the report only printed three decimal places. So that insignificant 127, the fourth, fifth, and sixth digits of that number resulted in a completely different weather model, right? Um, so that's kind of just a little analogy of a, something that seems insignificant today can turn out to be totally different later. And, it, you know, where the name butterfly effect come, comes from is they say that that's, that 127 is equivalent to the amount of wind generated by a butterfly's wing. So the whole weather pattern completely changed because of a little insignificant butterfly wing. Um, you know, I read through that. It says that doesn't really mean that a butterfly's wing can affect the weather, but it did in this model. It, the, <laughs> you get what I'm saying. The model, the model uh, came out totally different. So the same goes for our lives, right? The small decisions we make today can result in a big thing later. Uh, it can, it can uh, make a big difference in the future. In fact, it can make a big difference in your eternity, right? The decision you make today could determine where you end up after this life. Um, so just keep that in mind. Those little little compromises that Satan convinces us are all right. They get us a little closer to the edge, a little closer to the edge, a little closer to the edge, and soon enough we make one little small mistake and we're into the abyss and we have there's no there's no point in return. Or we're really damaged or we damage somebody else. We hurt our life really bad. Uh, so we have to have boundaries in place to keep us from veering off the path. Uh, one example of a good a healthy boundary is uh, you may have heard of this one. It's called the Billy Graham rule. So Billy Graham, you know the great uh, preacher who's passed away now, but uh, he was a great evangelist, brought many people to Christ. He, one of his boundaries was that he would not meet alone with a female other than his wife. So if he had to, uh, if he had to have a meeting with a female, he would not meet alone with her behind a closed door. He wouldn't travel alone with another with another female other than his wife. That was a boundary that he had set up because he knew that he wasn't exempt from temptation, um, and that things can happen. So uh, that's that's a good boundary to have, Mike. Uh, follows that rule and he encourages all the men that are leaders or even men in this church to have that same rule where uh, you don't don't even leave the chance for that to happen for anything to happen or for a rumor to be started um, just set that boundary in your life you know that it without that boundary you can have some regrets right um, boundaries can protect us from our regrets 
That's the next point in your bulletin there. If you're keeping up with the fill in the blanks, I got a lot of those. Sorry, I had to. I actually had to get rid of a few just to keep it short. But um, those boundaries can help keep us from having regrets. I, I guarantee, if you look back at some of your biggest regrets, some of the things you wish you could go back and change, if you'd have had a boundary in place to keep you from doing that, it would be a whole lot different, right? Um, those boundaries can keep us from making those big mistakes. Excuse me. We have to have financial boundaries in place, relational boundaries, professional boundaries, moral boundaries. All those things can help us to avoid regrets. Um, we're going to jump back to a little bit of scripture here and try to break it down a little bit. So this is Ephesians chapter 5. It starts in verse 15. It says, look carefully then how you walk. Uh, some translations there say, look carefully or be careful how you live. Um, so think about that. Look, look carefully then how you live or how you walk. Not as wise but unwise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Make wise decisions, right? Saying be careful how you live. Uh, try to be wise in your decisions. Think about your future. Before you make a decision, think about how it's going to impact your future. Be wise. Do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Now, this kind of goes back to uh, when you're making a decision, don't be foolish about it. Don't rush into it. Understand, maybe look to Scripture, pray to God, and say, what is your will in this, Lord? Where, where would you have me to go? Understand the Lord's will before you make that decision. Don't be foolish. <clears throat> this next part says, do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. A um, little bit of a, you know, most of you probably know this, but in Bible times, the water, when they kept water, try to store water away, it becomes stagnant and make them sick. So they ended up having to like water down wine to be able to, to uh, hydrate themselves. So, but it says, do not get drunk. It became easy to get drunk by just drinking what they used for water. So we take out that, the wine piece of that and kind of bring it to the days. Uh, do not get drunk because it leads to, it's that one, you know, it leads to another thing. Um, we start to compromise a little bit here, a little bit there. It leads to that other thing. Um, so I want you to kind of fill in the blank here uh, on a personal level. Uh, do not get drunk, which leads to blank. Think about in your life. I know um, for my life there's been times where I've been drunk and you know, it led to some stuff that shouldn't have happened. Anything, you know, as you think through that, does anything come to mind or anyone come to mind when you say, do not get drunk because it leads to do you know anybody, or maybe it's yourself, that wishes that they had a boundary of don't get drunk because of what it led to? If you read that, uh, read that right there, it says, for that is debauchery. Some, some of them say, some translations say, for it leads to debauchery. And what debauchery is is simply losing your self-control. So I feel bad, I need to turn, I'll keep turning that way and looking at those people. But uh, losing your self-control. So don't get drunk or do things that cause you to lose your self-control, to hand over the control of your life to someone or something else. Um, so that's what this is saying here. Do not lose your self-control. Our boundaries keep us from losing that self-control. It says, instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, once you become a believer, you experience the Holy Spirit. You, you gain the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes into you and guides your conscience, helps you make those right decisions. It uh, helps you to set up boundaries and guides you and helps you to resist temptation. So basically, this is coming down to don't lose your self-control. Don't, uh, don't let things lead you off to where you lose control of your life. Um, as I was reading through this uh, and I heard that, that phrase self-control, it, it, uh, it sparked back the, the thought of uh, the fruit of the Spirit, right? The last one that's the last fruit of the Spirit that's mentioned in Galatians 5, 22 and 23 is self-control. Um, to read through those real quick. Fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Um, you know, if, we, if we're filled with the Spirit, like that verse, the Ephesians 5 tells us, if we're filled with the Spirit, then we're going to have the fruit of the Spirit, one of those being self-control. Um, you know, if you have uh, the one other fruit of the Spirit that's kind of a good one for boundaries is patience. Uh, be patient before you make decisions. Think it through. Uh, ask God for guidance. Be patient. Put up a boundary of patience in your life. Um, I know that one, for me, that one comes into play for finance, finances. Uh, you know, it's really easy to take a piece of plastic and go get something today uh, that you may not be able to afford um, and pay interest on it. Pay, maybe pay double what you would have if you'd have just been patient and put away a little money to save for it. Uh, Dave Ramsey's a big, uh, big uh, a proponent of that. He says if you just 
take your car payment that you're making um, and put it away for a few years and then just don't touch it. Just let it collect interest. You can be a millionaire in, in 20, 30 years. So think about that. Be patient. My, my truck payment is, you know, it's enough that it hurts sometimes if I'd have just been patient and kept my old truck that was paid for. I could have been a millionaire. No. So anyway, <laughs> think, about, think about that. Be patient in your decisions. Be patient in your relationships. Don't rush into a relationship. Uh, set up some boundaries for yourself and for your, for your friends or your, uh, the person you're dating. Uh, set up some boundaries. You know, rushing into relationships, I'm sure can, you, you all know, can be uh, cause some big things to happen and lots of regrets and lots of mistakes. Um, another one that's pretty prominent today is maybe you need to block somebody on social media um, or maybe just totally get rid of your account, delete your account. Um, I know for me, there's lots of friends that I have from uh, past lives that I'm, you know, I'm friends with on Facebook, and they occasionally will post things that are pretty tempting, right? Um, they may post something that's uh, near or beyond a boundary that I've set for myself, um, so I have to either, you know, unfriend them, unfollow them, whatever, block that type of post, um, so that that temptation doesn't come back. Because I know where my mind would go. I'm, I know where my mind will go. So as soon as something like that happens, I've got signal flags going off, the Holy Spirit saying, nope, you don't need to go there, so get rid of it. Um, any of you guys ever seen the Fireproof movie? Some of you, yeah. Pretty, uh, it's a good good movie. It's kind of a little bit cliche, some uh, not the best acting, but it's a very good storyline and very good very good to watch and uh, help you to, to understand boundaries. So in that movie, the, the husband has struggles with pornography, um, and he just can't, he simply just can't stop doing it. So what's he do? He takes a computer outside and smashes it with a baseball bat. Uh, and maybe, maybe that's something you need to do today. Something, maybe uh, pornography is hurting your marriage, and uh, you need to. Maybe it's not your computer. Maybe it's your phone. Maybe you need to literally smash your phone. I said in the first service that your phone is probably more important than your marriage, or worth your your marriage is probably worth more than your phone, but. <laughs> Yeah, your your marriage is worth a whole lot more than your phone is what I'm trying to say, uh, and your computer for that matter. Your eternity is worth a whole lot more than that phone or that tempting thing that comes across that phone. So think about that. Set up some boundaries. Um, Romans 12 uh, says, Do not be conformed to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You know, like I said, one thing leads to another, so we have to set up some boundaries in our mind. We have to be re renew our minds and think about things that are uh, good and holy. Don't be conformed to what the world says. Don't be conformed to the patterns of the world. You know, they they try to tell us, oh, it's all right. Just take a little peek. It'll be all right. You ain't hurting nobody. Just compromise a little. That's what Satan keeps telling us. Compromise a little till you get right there on the edge, and then that one decision pushes you over. Uh, 2 Corinthians 10.5 says to take every thought captive to make it obedient to Christ. So when your mind starts to drift and you start thinking about things that you know are not holy, uh, Scripture tells us take that thought captive and say, I'm not going down that trail today. I'm not going to let my mind go there today. Um, I'm not going to drift off past the guardrail. I want, you know, today I want, us to, I want us to feel the weight of sin and the decisions, the decisions that we make. Um, that we're in, you know, we're in a we're in a spiritual battle. We're in a fight that's hard, uh, that's heavy. Uh, but I also want us to feel and know the freedom that can be found in Christ. All right? I've talked a lot about the negatives here, but um, there is freedom that can be found. We sang that song before, right before the message. Uh, you know, you saved me. You knew where I was at. I thought I was lost, but you knew where I was at. And you found, you picked up all my pieces. Jesus can pick up your pieces today, but we, you've got to come to Him. Um, he can help you to resist the temptations. Uh, another scripture I want to read to you. I didn't put this. I added this a little late, so it's not on the screen. But Colossians 2, 13 through 15. It says, You were dead because of your sins, and because of your sinful nature was not yet cut away. Then God made you alive with Christ, for he forgave all of our sins. He canceled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. In this way, he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them and on the cross. So if you're dealing with something this morning, if uh, you're struggling with setting up a boundary, or maybe you've gone beyond where you should have had a boundary and you've, you know, you're in a bad place, um, Jesus is there waiting. 
um, he'll accept you. He'll accept you in spite of that. Uh, just turn to him today, just like the prodigal son, right? He left, took all of his money, and made a lot of bad decisions. But when he came back, his father was there waiting for him. Maybe you've been you've been flirting with disaster, and you've not quite gone off the edge just yet. Take a step today. Take it. Take action, and put up a boundary to keep you from going any farther. Um, you know, if you failed to set up that boundary, and you're you're in an unwanted place, it's never too late to come back. Come back to Christ. There's forgiveness there. Uh, praise team's gonna come back up. We're going to wrap this thing up with a couple songs, but um, as we do these songs, you know, we always, uh, we always ask two questions. What is God saying to me? What am I going to do about it? Um, so as we're doing these songs, think about that. What's God saying? What's, where is he telling me I need a boundary in my life? Where do I need to put a guardrail up and take a step to do it? Maybe that first step is to accept Jesus as your Savior. Maybe you've never done that. Maybe you've never taken that step. Today's a good day to do that. Um, take that step. Resist the temptation that Satan's put out there, those flashy lures that he's flashing in front of you. Resist it. Put up, put up some boundaries to keep you away from that. We can't conquer this on our own, but with Christ we can. Um, as we're doing these couple songs, um, you know, we have our response time. You can come up, take communion, um, remember what Christ did for us, thank him for that. Um, you can sit in your chair, you can pray to yourself, you can maybe take out a communication card and write down a boundary that you need to set up, something that um, you can be totally anonymous with it, write it on that card, drop it in the, uh, drop it in the offering box as you leave. The elders will get those, will pray for you over the week, help you. If you, wanna, if you need help setting up a boundary, you don't want to be anonymous, you want to come and be known um, and confess a sin, we're here too. Come and tell us. We'll help you set those boundaries up so that you don't wander off the path. So um, we're going to do these couple songs. Let me pray before we do that. Lord, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for allowing us to be here this morning. Lord, we pray that uh, you would just help us to take the words that uh, you've given us. Take them to heart, Lord, and help us to set up boundaries in our lives. Uh, fill us with the Spirit, God. Help us to feel that, feel that nudge when we're... Uh, veering off the path a little bit that you would you would speak to our conscience and pull us back help us to resist the temptations that are thrown at us every day lord we know that through you we can conquer those help us god if we know someone who's struggling um, with setting up boundaries help us to to be a, a comfort to them and help them to understand where they're where they're mistaken lord Help us not to be a stumbling block to those, Lord, that might be struggling with something. Help us to understand that uh, some, something that we struggle with may not be a struggle, or something that they struggle with may not be a struggle for us at all, but help us to see those things and uh, set up boundaries so that we don't cause someone else to stumble. Lord, if there's someone here that doesn't know you, that's never put their trust in you as their Savior, we just ask that you would uh, work on their hearts today, God. Have them to, to feel the need for you in their life, Lord. Pray all this in Jesus' name.